Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Nicole Naditz, and I am your host for this series of podcasts focusing on performance assessments in world languages produced by the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. In this series, we are working up to a discussion of integrated performance assessments. So in our last episode, Lynn Fulton Archer shared strategies for designing robust performance assessments in the presentational mode. And that brings us to this third episode of the series. This episode is the first of two parts focusing on performance assessments in the interpersonal mode. Today, we will be examining the key characteristics of this mode and exploring different types of tasks, as well as rubrics for evaluating the performance of learners. And I am very pleased to welcome our special guest, Iman Arabi Katbi Hashem. Iman is the 2019 California World Language Teacher of the Year and the California representative to the Southwest Conference on Language Teaching. In addition, she is an Arabic language and culture instructor at California State University, Long Beach, and a program director at the California World Language Project Los Angeles site at Occidental College. As program director, she is responsible for fostering professional growth opportunities for the region's world languages teachers throughout their careers. Iman has shared her exceptional expertise by serving as a consultant for Arabic teaching programs at public and independent institutions, developing standards-based curricula and instructional resources, supervising teacher candidates, and serving as a StarTalk team leader. Thank you so much for joining us, Iman. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I was thinking that it might help to start by reviewing the key characteristics of the interpersonal mode. What should educators keep in mind about this mode of communication? It's from its uh, meaning, it's like the interpersonal communication. It's a two-way communication that it takes place between two or more people. It occurs uh, face-to-face or now with the world of the global world. It's in a virtual environment. And actually, it is happening in the uh, virtual environments even more. Uh, it, it occurs through, again, uh, listening and speaking. That it used to be like you call in a phone, you talk face-to-face. It's only listening and speaking or in writing and reading and writing, which is going to be uh, something like uh, I'm writing an email and waiting for uh, a response back. However, with today's uh, technology, it's actually, it is integrating all these uh, skills together because I might be talking to you at one point and then later on I can type to you and you can respond to me in writing or you can respond to me by you know recording your voice so it is integrated all together this conversation it is uh, again uh, it, it is spontaneous it is not scripted it is not something that I design. I really need to listen carefully to what you are saying in order to carry on the conversation, to start explaining or start to uh, 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 share with you my thoughts, my reactions, my feelings, my opinions. So all of this, it, is, it makes it so vital and live And it is always depending on the people that that they are working with it. It's not only in one person that convey. It has the most important part is the negotiation of meaning. Because so many times we are misunderstood. And this is uh, what this uh, mode, it gives us the chance actually to express ourselves and to clarify the misunderstanding and continue going back and forth until we come into a conclusion of understanding what you are saying, understanding my ideas, or, um, you know, coming into um, a reasonable, uh, you know, findings together as we agree on or disagree on. So, but it is, it is the communication, it is the negotiation of meaning, and that is what makes it so unique and special. Absolutely. I really want to go back to what you said about that kind of very special nature of interpersonal communication as something that is, it's not even just two-way, as you said, 
early on, but that it really does require that active listening or active reading and the negotiation of meaning so that in addition to clarifying misunderstandings, there's an opportunity for users of the language to, an opportunity and even a responsibility for users of the language to confirm their understandings and confirm that they themselves are being understood in the way that they intended. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's true. Mm-hmm. Um, so as you think about tasks that teachers can design for both the practice and then the assessment of the interpersonal mode, what would you say are the characteristics of a well-designed interpersonal task? So it is, uh, we really need to think about our students. We really need to think about a meaningful uh, an interesting task for them that it's related to their life. It is, uh, it's connected to um, their age, and it should be relevant uh, to uh, uh, to to their life. And they need it to communicate in the real world. Remember, this is like with the interpersonal mode or with the standards. Right now, we wanted the students to function uh, in a real, authentic context. So the conversation or the interaction between uh, the individuals or between others, it, it is an opening opportunity. This is what this, our students are looking for. And we really need to design tasks that it prepares them for this real world situation. And we really need to think about their age we really need to think about their interest. We really need to think what they need. Then it becomes something vital for them. So it is, uh, uh, we really need to keep all these uh, in our minds when we are designing the task. And then we need to put inside it uh, the issues of all the characteristics of the, that we are talking about the interpersonal communication. Does it allow for real negotiation of meaning? Are they going to listen to the question and then they respond and answer to it? Because so many times, and again, and you can see it more uh, vividly when it is at the beginning level as a novice level, it's really, you really need to give them all the tools to be able to, to do this. So in within the characteristic, within the context of um, uh, the performance task that we have to give them the option and show them that it needs to be negotiated. I really need to answer, to listen this question and what's that they said in order to, commu- uh, to add more questions, to ask more questions, to work on it. And, um, and it, it helped them to initiate and maintain and sustain the conversation. It is very important to have this text, uh, the, the task designed in order to let them do all of this in a natural uh, and realistic way. You know, I'd like to actually follow up on that with another question. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us some insight into the ways that teachers might build into the learning experiences for their novice learners as you start and you were starting to talk about that we really Mm want to do this from the beginning of language Mm -hmm. instruction Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and we know that novice learners you know function at a level that is most comfortable with memorized words and phrases very 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 um, personal like personalized discrete repetitive topics and so on so what are some things that teachers can do to build in, if necessary, as memorized chunks even, the ability to begin negotiating meaning or to help maintain a conversation. Um, what, are, what is some advice you give teachers who are trying to build in more spontane- spontaneity even for their novice learners? Well, the first thing that I, I do, I give them so many different um, formulaic language that, that they can use. Even with the question, there isn't any only one way to ask the question. So I expose them to a variety of chunks that, that they can use for asking the questions. Another things, again, they need these gamuts that, that, that they are going to ask 
excuse me, I'm sorry, I did not understand. Can you repeat again? Or even, you know, some uh, uh, phrases to start with. As you say, da 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 da, so it, it helped them to see the natural way of creating a conversation. One thing that I do with my students, especially at the novice level, we talk about, okay, um, so the context is you are going to call someone or we are going to have a, a guest speaker or um, a person on Skype and you are going to talk to them from a university and then you are going to exchange information about what you wanted to do and so on. So what's the things that you would like to know about this person what's kind of a conversation you know you wanted to carry on and we start to think about it we need to think help them to think about the task thinking about it's talking about the talk again this is the, the other way to uh, to say it it is what would i ask how would i ask it ask it. and um so what's the phrases that i need give them variety give them uh, for me in arabic for example uh, i give them dialect and modern standard arabic sometimes the dialect it's easier because of the genderless some kind of sometimes it's not gender related and it's the hardest things in arabic that it makes it harder in uh, you know puts it in the category four so it is it helps them and sometimes it's the pronunciation Sometimes that they get stuck or in their tongue, it's not easy one word so that they can have the other word. And this way, again, that they have a repertoire of language and tools and strategies that it helps them to accomplish the task. And then it has some kind of a spontaneous and uh, follow up and so on. Another things that I do with them, and I used to teach them uh, now, nouns, 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 and forget to give them a structure that, that they can use this noun in it, or a verb, or a thing. So right now, I am teaching these structures, and the nouns that that's going to change. And again, it's a follow-up questions. It is very important, the follow-up questions, and train them to ask, instead of going horizontal, horizontal we go uh, vertical. So we ask question after question. This is how that they are trained to follow up with the questions in a natural way, in uh, uh, a more, and then that they can choose about which issue to go a little bit more further and deeper. And then it becomes more of it picking and choosing between these chunks to create spontaneous uh, question. And then I need to listen to you. Yeah, absolutely. I, you brought up so many good points between the gam the conversational gambits that we all use to pause, stall for time, interrupt, request clarification. Um, but also, I think you made a really important point about preparing learners for the task because they will be much more successful. It's just like the way in lesson design, you want to prepare learners for the upcoming lesson by reactivating prior knowledge, you know, drawing out the experiences that are going to be helpful to them. So that's going to be equally important in these spontaneous tasks. And follow-up questions are huge. As soon as our students have the, the question bank, mm -hmm. right, we can start a lot, having them use follow-up questions that do become a little bit, it's like an introduction to spontaneity. Even if the task itself was really guided, they can then follow up with now plus one, you know, add a follow-up question to your partner's response and your partner doesn't know which question it will be. So they really have to listen. Um, so just a lot of really good points there. And it leads right into our next question, actually. You were saying earlier that there is more than one type of interpersonal task. And so I was hoping you could share just a few more examples of different types of interpersonal tasks that you've done with your learners. Okay. The first one that I felt like it was very successful of meeting, uh, it was a, the topic of the unit, is meeting uh, uh, an Arab, uh, you know, students from an Arab cultures. And we use the Skype. Uh, to communicate and to interact with each other. 
so that the students had the chance to to talk to the person and to uh, um, to ask questions, to ask about their studies, to ask about their what did they do every day, how how's their uh, you know they look like, what do they like, what kind they reach to the level is what kind of film you like to watch, what kind of programs that you uh, you follow up. Oh, you watch Netflix. Oh, really? And we watch Netflix. So, and again, and so sudden that they moved again to the songs and the music, and then that they start to say, what's your favorite song? Who is your favorite uh, uh, artist? And they found a lot of common, you know, uh, interest and common things between each other. So that was one of the, for the beginners class, and it was very, very successful. And it was uh, in, uh, in reading, uh, I'm sorry, in listening and speaking. The other one that I used and I use most of the time with my students is uh, the WhatsApp. And this is with the level one. And we have WhatsApp, we start with the very basics. Like instead of saying to each other in the morning, good morning, how are you doing? They do this through the typing and writing. And it serve me two two things because arabic it says uh, it's hard to write sometimes for the connecting the letters because we write like in the calligraphy so we uh, we ask them when that they are typing it they see it firsthand by itself it's coming together to make the word okay so it helps them into their spelling it helps them into the reading and listening uh, reading and writing and uh, uh, of course, that they are using most of the, from the chunks that they've learned about how you're doing, uh, did you complete your homework? Was your homework hard or easy? And it start to accumulate. It start to become more sophisticated along the way. So at the beginning of the semester, only greetings, saying hello, okay, I miss you, and so on. Then it becomes later on talking about something, either in the homework, something that they did the day before, something that's of interest, something of their hobbies, when did they, they do, what they uh, uh, they cooked the, the night before, did they uh, do some activity. So it becomes more of an extended. And this is for the, the uh, reading and, and writing. So, and this is, this, again, from the beginning level. The other things that, um, what I did, uh, again, this year, it is, um, with a, a fl uh, flip grid. And with a flip grid, they introduced that they talked about certain things that is of their interests. And then their uh, friends that they started to write comments. So here it is the integration between listening and the responding in the writing instead of only uh, uh, listening and speaking. And I like that because again, it, it provides more of uh, preparedness for the real world. So if you don't know how to say things, you can record it. If you can write it, it's easier for you. You can write it, you can write the comments and that they exchange things. And it was so nice because you see that, that they're giving them feedback saying, well, I like this game. I didn't like, oh, can we play together on, on that game? Uh, one other thing that, um, I, I used, again, it is uh, um, because we are right now in a virtual, you know, teaching for, for the COVID-19. So what we did, we used the Zoom. And I used to tell them, you can plan your um, activities together. So it is, again, but that they have to do it all in, in Arabic. And one of the things that, that they've done it's simulating when you interact with family members who are ab uh, abroad or uh, far away. And because we are right now, we are not with the distance, you know, uh, social distancing uh, distance. So what we did, I, I, call, I said, call them, talk to them, see how that they are doing. Are they doing well? So uh, how is the things is, uh, how that they are spending their time? Um, are they going to work or are they, they doing all of their work at home? Uh, are they able to, uh, to do something that they like 
for going around the block, for example, walking, walking their dogs, um, uh, doing things with their parents. Uh, are they helping them? Are they, they? So it's a lot of conversation. And I was so amazed with the kind of the interaction that they recorded for me and then that they provided. And that's for me, it is really level one and doing all of this, they felt so proud and that they felt that, yes, we can do uh, a lot of things with even with the, with the chunks that we've learned. Absolutely. Um, a couple of things that I want to leave our viewers and listeners with, um, both the fact that you've really made a conscious choice and effort to fold the interpersonal mo mode into their learning experiences on a routine basis. So that it never becomes something that they suddenly have to be afraid of because they hardly ever do it. And mm -hmm. it, right, it's become part of what is just the natural way that we're going to be working together and learning together in this community that we have for our world languages class. Mm -hmm. um, and then really, really also building in them a, that sense of accomplishment at what they can do. And the fact that you're focusing on what they can do um, at their range of proficiency with who they are as learners, um, because so many students get, you know, a little bit worried about not being able to communicate the way they want to because they can't seem to get it out the way they could in their native language. And they feel like they're supposed to be just as good in this new language as they are in their native language. And we mm -hmm. want to say, no, let's celebrate what it is that you can do because that's really amazing given the amount of time that you've had in terms of exposure and practice and so on. Mm -hmm. um, how can teachers provide learners with opportunities to embed intercultural knowledge into their interpersonal tasks? That's very, very important because I remember when I started to do the interpersonal a long time ago, and again, we are uh, perfecting or improving uh, our instructions and preparing our students to be uh, interacting in a cultural, uh, appropriate, culturally appropriate ways. Because I remember the first time that we had the conversation with uh, with that students overseas, and a guy while he was talking to her, he asked her about her phone number. Okay, and this is. For us. So she was polite. She said, no, I'm not going to give it to you. It is not for, but in his mind, this is one of the chunks that I've learned and I want to use. Okay. But for her giving you my phone number, it has a lot of cultural, you right. know, ramifications. So it is, it is for her. She apologized him nicely and he felt not at ease. At that point, I decided you know what, there's a lot of cultural things that we really need to, to think about. It's what do you ask, when do you ask it, how you ask it, and if it's appropriate for certain age, for certain people, not for everybody. So here where I create, I started to create for them a different, uh, you know, skits or small activities that it prepares them for that. Even the way that we talk or we look at each other and uh, when I'm asking or follow up with that. So for example, when somebody is telling you about uh, things of bounty, then you have to respond to him and saying, well, mashallah. So it is not, I'm not an envious to you. I am actually uh, giving my, the blessing and feeling good for you as if it is for me. So it's, these are, you know, words and phrases that it helps to ease the conversation. It makes it uh, more uh, natural and makes it more appropriate for the person who is on the other end. Or when I hear it, sometimes some people, they don't feel comfortable using these um, cultural phrases at least that they be aware and understand that these are used not out of, again, it's being religious and being for me, I'm teaching you about the religion. No, I'm saying, thank God, because I'm feeling like 
it is so much good. It is, I'm, I'm feeling good for you. And this is good of what we are giving. It's like being thankful instead right. of saying thank you. So yeah. if you don't feel like it, you don't have to say it. But when you hear it, it doesn't make you feel uncomfortable. So it is understanding this. The other issues that I found out, like I said, with the conversation, with getting to know each other, it's a lot of borrowing. They discover that there are some words that actually it takes, uh, it takes and they start to conjugate it. It is the original word, it's in English, but then it starts to conjugate it, to be conjugated in Arabic. And we laugh about this and we talk about this. And uh, so it's these borrowing and making it theirs. It is, again, it's a way to bring everybody together, to put them at ease with the conversation, to make them more um, global, uh, you know, uh, inter uh, conversation uh you, you know uh, or um uh you know communicator uh globally because it's not only for arabic it helps them to understand others it helps them to understand when to say it uh, and is the appropriateness of saying certain things to certain people so i teach them these uh vocabulary Sometimes it's just like to encourage them to go on because we have something in English similar way, but it's not identical. It can be similar or it can be different. So it's when do you say this? How do you say it? And you practice and practice within the smaller pieces that, that they have. And then that they become at least um, the first is noticing it and then practicing it and to, to use it. Yeah, really bringing out for the student that language is so much more than the words, right? There is behind all the words and even the structures and the way language is put together from language to language is a complete reflection of the cultural perspectives. So helping them see that, but also I just love your example, you know, of helping learners understand you know, the, the when and the where and the to whom of the way that we interact. Um, and just giving them that opportunity to understand, as you said, not just in the target language, but just that global understanding or broader understanding of the fact that people approach every situation from their own cultural perspective and that lens. And that's always going to color how they interact in every situation. And that's something that we as world language educators actually really help our students understand and hopefully take with them out into the world, no matter who they're interacting with. Okay. Um, how might educators provide learners with opportunities to practice and receive feedback in the interpersonal mode before they're assessed? And this is what we started touching on it a, a little bit earlier. We said, like, we st it becomes part of the daily routine. I tell them inside our classroom that we really need to take the advantage of being together to practice what we are learning. So when we learn these chunks, they need from the beginning, it is step by step. It is like uh, teaching them or training them how to ride the bicycle. And I like this metaphor a lot because it is with your children, like you bring these, uh, uh, you know, a scooter that is like just it has the three wheels and then they start with that and you carry them and you hold them in the back and then you take off the training wheels and you're still holding them back and then until you let them go. So this is a very, very important so we start from the beginning of a brainstorming of when is this task? What do we do? How do you ask about this? Um, we did this unit about, um, uh, about going uh, to studying abroad, okay? And when the studying abroad that you wanted to choose the university, you wanted to ask about uh, which one and uh, 
uh, that it matched your needs and the, their programs. So here we started to learn the chunks that it's talking about, areas of studies, it is about tuition, it's about living on campus or outside of the campus. And so all of these chunks, and we started to build on it. Uh, slowly and then we come into the other issues is like is it better to be on campus or to take it out of campus to rent uh, with a family or to rent with uh, a group of students and we started to talk about what's better and then that they discuss and then how you ask and because different countries again it has a different uh, uh, different dynamics and different classes. So if you are in Lebanon, I wouldn't advise you to be um, within the families because most likely that they're going to talk to you in English versus if you are in Syria, not now, okay, but if you are in Syria, it's the families use the target language, use Arabic all the time. So, and this is, it's very important to to understand that and to, uh, to, uh, to, to ask these questions and to learn these uh, structures that, that they can ask these questions. The question and follow up on these questions. So, and again, it's asking about what's the cost with whom? Is it important to, to know about the transportation? So what's kind of a transportation? And here you see different people going different ways. So I need to talk about how do you come? How do you commute connected to their life? We are in here. We are in the United States. How do you come? What kind of transportation do you use? Uh, do you live on campus? You don't live on campus. Why? What's so it's all these conversations. It's a built in in a small lot of chunks and going it is like, um, step by step in order to have the full picture. So going from the end in mind, I wanted to, for them to be able to complete this uh, performance task that I described and we discussed. Then we go back to say, okay, how am I breaking it into smaller chunks and each chunks that I would connect it to something of an input and then get to the input and play with these input and work with these input practice with the uh, activities daily activities it's like a lineup i use a lot of lineup uh, uh, activities it's the circle in circle out we use a lot of surveys we use a lot of like the hot seat we use it's a lot of these techniques in order to prepare them or, uh, you know, strategies or activities. And I call them activities because they are not a real uh, full, you know, uh, interpersonal uh, task. So, uh, so that they do this slowly and do the recycling and spiraling, it's recycling and spiraling, then that they would become ready at the end. If we miss any of these pieces, when did they reach at the end? They really need a lot of help and support with them and that they cannot and that they feel overwhelmed. So, so this is what I do. It's breaking it into smaller pieces, practice, 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 and do not wait for even for cultural knowledge or cultural practice or uh, vocabulary. I give it to them in smaller chunks. And that is how that they become like, okay, I have this wealth of uh, repertoire of uh, chunks and words and, uh, uh, you know, phrases that I can use in order to, and I'm ready to, to do the real task. So can you share one or two brief strategies for how learners might receive feedback? Maybe not even just from the teacher, but how they receive feedback to let them know you know, where they are strong and where they have areas for growth? Usually, I, again, we built in with the, um, we have different like rubrics to use and, or let's say different checklists. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with the beginning with the checklist, it's for me the importance to know, 
are you on task? So this is again that I give them feedback. Oh, you were able to ask five people. You came up and you are reporting. You can tell me that you asked them and this is what's happened or you find something in common with, with each other. So it's a small thing, but you are able to accomplish this and you were using the target language. I don't talk about correct, incorrect. Okay, you were nice to the others because when they didn't know things is the, again, uh, I think it is um, uh, from Sherman Gilson book. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Donato is his, the, the original were uh, Richard Donato who had that, uh, you the know, talk uh, the, the talk, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's being nice to the other person. It's being understanding. It is, this is one of the things that I really, uh, from the beginning, try to, uh, to show them that as, uh, you know, carrying a conversation, you are partners. You are there to support each other. So you are going to find if something that you, are, can, you cannot do, your friend can help you with or support you. And then for the next round, you can support the others. So here you can get more of a support. So this is a, a feedback. Again, from me, it's like you can con complete the task. You can know or you would be able to know which where areas that by assessing yourself, I can do this uh, by myself. It says like very easily, I needed some help uh in this area or that area so this is kind of a feedback that they get sometimes it's a feedback from each other when they ask him would you please repeat again or do you mean this or uh okay i'm sorry i i didn't hear so all of this it's a feedback to them of indirect feedback Mm -hmm. It's feedback. It doesn't have to be always oh, with the grades and with the things. Exactly. It's like it's a, so it's indirect feedback. Oh, you know what? I wasn't opening my mouth correctly. Or you know what? I used this word. I was asking where you're from. However, that they answered me, I live in. So I must be either you did not understand or I repeat the questions or redo the question. So it's again, these are kind of um like feedback when it starts uh, to go a little bit gross is with a major chunk of the uh, performance task is the performance it's the rubric or it is showing them uh, and i learned this from paul sandrak again it's just to put it's what's in the middle it is like where am i now and where am i gonna go at the end. And I really need to check along this continuum. I can ask the questions. I can, I cannot ask. I'm mostly answering questions. I'm still having trouble asking questions. Oh, I can follow up with the questions. It's not only using these couple of questions. Okay. I'm using a lot of vocabulary in chunks from the ones that, that they have learned. Oh no, I'm still depending on very little chunks. Uh, and, and words as the cultural, uh, you know, remarks or culturally appropriateness. I'm still really don't know how to interact with that. I'm still mm -hmm. interacting in this. So it, it gives them the range and that they can put in between where that they are and where that they need help and support. Absolutely. And um, I think we'll be linking both the talk score um, document that we, you referred to a little bit and also the single point rubric um, that it's come up actually and I think it actually came up when we interviewed Paul Sandrock as the opening mm -hmm. episode mm -hmm. um, so we'll link both of those as resources for our viewers and our listeners but I also really like what you said about calling out the informal indirect feedback and making sure students are aware to be receptive to that and to notice it and then to think about what might have caused whatever breakdown they noticed because sometimes you know helping them understand it's not always you 
Mm-hmm. Right. But if, if it's, you know, either a rephrasing on your part or more support for the person with whom you're conversing so that they can be more successful. Um, it's a really, really great point. And you actually led right into the next question, which is about rubrics, actually. So why are rubrics so important or so helpful um, for the evaluation of student performance? If we're looking at it from the teacher lens and looking at the possibility of, you know, trying to provide some kind of summative score or grade to dozens or even a hundred interpersonal conversations, depending on how many students they have, um, Why are rubrics so important and helpful for this mode? For me, it is the rubrics, it it set the tone or it it describes what what's the roadmap for the students. It is what's the expectation of uh, their performance. It it lists the criteria. It tells them how good uh, and how well that you are uh, you know, achieving these goals. And it is, again, we mentioned that the issue is the, uh, the level of the qualities and it is um, how good of, uh, you are producing the language. So it, it is creating a roadmap for the students. It show me what I would expect, okay? And it described for me, it's according to our goals, our, um, the goals of the units or the goals of the task, it is what I need to do. Because sometimes like you, if, if you don't have a good rubrics, you say, okay, carry on conversation that, okay, I ask two, three questions and I'm comfortable with that and I'm fine. So I completed the task and here I'm telling you, yes, you completed the task, but this is where you are at the basics. So if you wanted to, to really uh, be able to, or to show that you can do it at the higher level, this is what you need to do. You really need to use more of the vocabulary. You really need to use more of strategies to help you can maintain this conversation to help you to, uh, to uh, again, share more ideas, to, ex- uh, to negotiate the meaning, uh, to listen carefully. So it's all of this, it is built in inside the rubric. So that is why it's so important and uh, for the students to see the continuum I would look at it as a continuum where I can start when I aspire to reach and to be able and to feel really uh, good about what I'm doing and how I'm doing it at the level that we are at. Because again, we cannot, students wants to do everything. So in here I'm saying, no, this is, you are still in the novice, you are in the intermediate. This is where you have the range that you can perform within that. And if you reach that point, you are magnificent. So you can feel really, really good about yourself. And it is, again, it's a baseline for the the performance. It is you can yourself see and communicate and see it where is it uh, with the feedback. Oh, yeah, I can see where is the area. It's no longer like, okay, I made mistakes, five grammatical mistakes. It doesn't, I don't count. I'm not going to count how many times. Is were you able to, you know, uh, uh, to complete the task? Uh, and were you able to use a lot of vocabulary follow-up questions? Uh, would you able to answer these questions? Were you able to, to go around if you don't know the answers? to go around it and try to answer it in a different ways? Were you able to get the hints from your partner when that they give it to you. I tell them this is not, I, I'm not going to call it say, cheating. This is actually a strategy so that you can go listen carefully. They might give you some tools. They might give you some lead so you can use it and continue and build on it. And here's you are equal partner to carry on this and smooth, smoothly uh, take the ship along, uh, you know, the ocean and take it to a, a, to a higher place or a different place right. that you both feel very good about it. 
Right. And so what you're really calling out too, is that it's, it's not just a tool for the teacher. It's also a tool for the student, but only if it's written in a way where the students can clearly understand it and, and it's provided to them early enough in the sequence where they can actually kind of check their work along the way and realize this is ultimately what I'm going to have to do. How am I doing in getting to that point? So it's really a tool for both parties. Yeah, actually, I start with them from the beginning. And again, the first year, it was harder because you need to create something of a product to right. show them. But later on, when you have plenty of products, actually, I share with them the, uh, the rubric and they become partner, equally partner to improve the rubric. Nice. Yes. And because we bring these uh, examples and we start to talk about it and say, well, okay, we've seen something real and then let's look at this, how close it is. What do they need? Why do you think that they fit in this category? Or why do you think, what's you, what can you help them? Or what's advice that you can give to them? What kind of a feedback to improve? Right. And why did you put it? And you'll find that students sometimes argue about yes. uh, the, the things. And then we say, okay, let's look at the rubrics. Does it show us exactly if this is the point included or it's not included in there, if it is counted or it's not counted. So it is, uh, uh, it becomes like it, it's not only in a language that they understand, they own it. Yes. Because and that they, they become a partner into the creation and that they give you some ideas. Sometimes it's not in your mind. and It fits this mm -hmm. group of students, honestly, and always continue, uh, uh, you know, perfecting it. With, with the rubrics, because rubrics are really um, tricky if we wanted them to provide yes. uh, the clear road for, uh, for the students and to get the feedback along the way. So it is important to, they become a partner, equal partner, and use it along the way that you're saying, and uh, that they, they know how to improve and where to improve and, uh, and they've yeah. almost done some norming by evaluating student progress products along that rubric they've done some norming and some calibrating right and that mm -hmm. also goes back to what the what we were talking about the about the single point rubric because it actually tends to be fairly or i will say at least relatively easier for an instructor mm -hmm. to identify what meeting standard looks like but mm -hmm. to identify all the ways that a student might exceed or all the ways a student might not quite achieve the standard becomes a lot more complicated. And so then when a student produces, you know, provides you with this product and they have something in their product that you didn't account for in the rubric, as the teacher, you're kind of stuck, right? Right, absolutely. Um, so that also goes back to what you were saying about continuing to evolve the rubrics and make them better and have students have ownership and, and voice in that process. Mm -hmm. I think that's like going to be a really valuable takeaway for our listeners. Um, our last question actually is something we've touched on a little bit, but you might have a couple more key points you want to add. You've touched on evolve, the, the rubric evolves um, and that the students have, have some voice in it. But what else would you say, are there any remaining characteristics of a well-designed rubric that you would like to kind of draw out? So it's a well uh, design rubrics it describes the expected performance in words that are clear to the students. It uh, uh, it is uh, you know it's it specified the criteria. It's the task description. It has a scale, a rating scale with the scoring in it and uh, indicators of a description of a quality of the work. And these are, it's, they are very important in the, uh, the rubrics. And all of this to serve the comprehensibility, the quality of the communication, and the ability of to show their interculturality or understand the intercultural. So it is going to be in the service of um, achieving uh, better understanding, more quality of communication, or some the others is the communicators that they understand each other, uh, they can follow with each other, and that the, their use of uh, 
the intercultural knowledge that, that they acquired and that they can practice it and that they can, again, uh, use it. Um, it's the easiness of um, use. It shouldn't be complicated. No. <laughs> shouldn't, so, you know, um, so this is for me where it's that they are simple. It is like less is, is, uh, is, is more. more. Yeah. Less is more. Focus on what's really important for this task. Focus on the key things and let them understand it and take them to, uh, you know, give them the chance to apply this and see it in action and see how that they can use it as a measuring tools and helpful uh, tools to improve their, uh, you know, uh, their productivity to improve their uh, performance. Right. So that it's, again, it's actually not just serving this academic purpose of communicating a grade, but really informing the learners and providing them with information about their language use that they can use. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what you said about it being focused, um, really honing in on, on what it is that is essential in the task, and even what you said about enfolding in the interculturality pieces, you know, brings me to kind of that closure point of saying it goes back to something that someone said, I have no idea who we've seen it. I think you've probably seen this around as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we assess what we value. And with the rubric, we assess and we assign a grade to what we value, right? Okay. So we want the rubric to be really a clear statement of what it is that we value in our students communication on all levels, including interculturality. Correct. So thank you so much, Iman. I think that, you know, your examples and your wealth of knowledge on this topic are going to be so valuable to our listeners and viewers. So I just want to thank you again for joining us today on this podcast and being our guest. It's my pleasure to be here. And thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. It was my pleasure. Um, and actually, in our next episode, we're going to continue our conversation around the interpersonal mode with the 2018 Actful National Language Teacher of the Year, Ying Jin. And we're going to be honing in a little bit more on some of the logistics around the interpersonal mode in the age of kind of distance or hybrid learning. Um, because we do suspect that as we approach fall, that I think a lot of our school systems will still be really looking at designing and delivering instruction in that way. So I hope all of you will join us then and bye for now, everybody.